And I've seen many, many clients who say, but no one loves me. I can't find love. There isn't anybody for me. And that simply is not true. All these people have got fat hair and thin thighs, but I've got thin hair and fat thighs, so therefore I don't count. Yes, you do. Love is not to be earned. Love is not to be worked for or run after or bought or even traded. My gran used to say, every pan has a lid. And when I found my husband, I found my lid. He found his lid, and that's a wonderful thing. But it took me a long time. I was a very lonely kid. I was quite lonely as an adolescent. I was a single parent, and even though I had friends, that was really lonely to raise my child without assistance, without someone else to lean on. So why do we believe that no one loves us? Well, that really stems from us not loving ourselves. You know, I think magazines and a lot of TV shows do a lot of damage because we look at what I call fake images of perfection. We become overexposed to images of fake perfection. We watch Friends and there's a waitress living in Central Park in Manhattan. That isn't even remotely possible. There are women who've just had a baby and an hour later they look amazing. There are people who are living perfect lives, they're not real. And we compare ourselves and think, oh, I don't look like that. There's something wrong with me. But it really goes back much, much further. When you were a baby and you came onto the planet, you had very simple needs. I need to connect to the person that carried me, my mother and my father. My mother really, more than anything, I need connection. My needs as a tiny baby, here they are. I need to feel safe. I need to feel connected, I need to feel I matter, I need to feel protected, I need to feel loved, I need to feel that my needs are worth being met. And for many children, they're not. Mum and Dad are at work, the baby's in daycare, Dad isn't around, Mum is depressed, Dad or Mum is drinking, there are other kids, they're always fighting. They start to say to that baby, I need you to be perfect. You must be a grade A student. I need you to look better. Look at your cousin. She never makes a mess. Look at your brother. He could read when he was four. What's wrong with you? Now, these are minor, but they're a major. Two parents who emotionally abuse their children, neglect them, hit them, hurt them. There's sexual abuse, emotional abuse, mental abuse. And when that happens, that child does not stop loving the parent, they stop loving themselves. The same as if you got a little puppy and kicked it, he wouldn't stop loving you because you're the source of provisions so would begin to believe there was something wrong with it. So very early on we buy into this belief, I'm not lovable. My mom's always crying, my mom's always at work, my dad's always angry. My brother's always picking on me. My brother hurts me. My sister takes my stuff. Kids at school bully me. I can't learn like other people. I haven't got the stuff other people have got. I'm different and I can't connect. And you see, when we're born on the planet, we are so wired to survive and we survive by finding connection and avoiding rejection. From a tiny puppy to a kitten, to a child, we know the truth. If I find connection and avoid rejection, I'll make it. And then we have someone in the house that rejects us, an older brother. I worked with a psychiatrist once who was so shut down and so sad. And she told me this story that when she was born, her brother hated her and he'd come and look at her in the car and go, I hate you, I hate you. And the parents go, oh, he doesn't mean it. He loves you, but he'd always say, I hate you and he'd pinch her and scratch her every chance he got. She grew up feeling hated by him, couldn't really form friendships, had no husband, no friends, no life, no pets, because of this belief she carried that no one likes me. In fact, her brother had his own issues with Asperger's. It was nothing to do with her. It was him, but when you're a small child, you can't rationalize. Before the age of five, you have feeling and no logic. And if you have no logic, you can't work out 
your dad married your mum at 18, they weren't even suited. He feels he's lost his chance, he's drinking now because he feels like he's a waste of space. You feel like you're a waste of space. So many children buy into this belief early, I'm not enough, I'm not lovable enough, I'm not interesting enough, I'm not attractive enough, smart enough, worthy enough, lovable enough, I'm not enough. And when you believe that, you expect other people to be disappointed in you and you often are alone. You're too scared to let someone in in case they too reject you. You know, I, I had a client whose father came to London on kinder transport. That's when in Germany they were putting children on the trains and they were leaving and they knew they'd probably never see their parents again. My client, whose father was put on that train, his grandfather fainted on the station as he put his son on the train, knowing he'd never see them again. And he said, my father was so cold, he wouldn't let me hug him. When I said I loved him, he said, don't say that. But you see, the father could not ever allow himself to be that vulnerable again. He put up a wall and said, if, you don't, if I don't let love in, I can't be hurt. And many people who don't have love don't have love because they're scared of being rejected. So they keep love over there. They're scared of being hurt. They're scared of being vulnerable. Or they simply believe I'm not lovable enough. I'm not beautiful. I'm not a 10. I'm not interesting. Who's going to want me with three kids? Who's going to want me with cellular? Who's going to want me? I don't have a great job. I'm not a great provider. And we become the critical voice in our head. I heard a story about a woman who was talking to a man she'd met online. And online they communicated. He thought she was wonderful. She thought he was wonderful. They arranged to meet, they spoke for several weeks, they finally met, and after half an hour I said, this isn't working, and he got up and he left. And I want you to imagine she called a friend and said, well, he got up and left, and the friend said, well, why wouldn't he get up and leave? I mean, look at you. You've got cellulite all over your legs, your hips are too wide, your breasts are too small, you've got a child at home, you're a single parent, who would want you? You haven't got a degree, you're not interesting. But it wasn't the friend who said this, it was her. She was so down on herself, so critical, and she projected that out. And when people pick that up, it, it's not sexy or alluring. So why does no one love you? Here's the honest answer, because you don't love you. You have to believe that you are worth being with. When you believe you are worth being with, other people will believe that you are worth being with. So you have to fall in love with yourself. You have to think, hey, if I had the best boyfriend, the best girlfriend in the world, what would they say to me? What would the best husband or wife or partner say? Well, they'd go, hey, you're amazing. You're the one. I love everything about you. It's just something about you. With all your faults, I love you still. Your crooked smile, what, what, a little bit of fat on your tummy. So much about you I love. I just love you. I love your voice, I love everything. You're a flawed person, I'm a flawed person. The best we can ever hope to have is to meet another flawed person and have a beautiful flawed relationship together. If no one loves you, that's because you think you are not worth it. Amy Mullins, um, who is missing her lower legs, is married to a movie star. He knows he's lucky to have her, Chantal Brown has got Impetigo and is beautiful. There's a beautiful model in England who's got Down syndrome, absolutely gorgeous, by the way. James Corden is far from model material, but women love him. He's funny. You don't have to be perfect to be loved. To be loved, you need one thing. It is really one thing. You know what it is? You need to believe you are lovable. You will attract love to the degree that you believe you are worth it. When I was a kid, I thought it was a hideous, ugly freak. I was so self-conscious, I couldn't even hold anyone's gaze. 
And then I got older and I became a bit like the ugly duckling that changed. And I had a great boyfriend who adored me, but I never really believed I was worth that level of adoration. I faked everything until I felt like a big fake fraud. And I would never do that again. Fall in love with yourself. And then you give the whole world permission to fall in love with you. Say, I'm lovable. Don't say, because I've worked really hard to be a size eight. Or because, you know, I've got a degree. Or because I've had my teeth fixed. Or because I'm wearing Armani. No. You are lovable because you are lovable. You are lovable. That's it. And when you can say, I am lovable, I am lovable, I am worthy of love, deserving of love, ready for love. And by the way, while you're holding back from love and not letting yourself find love, some great person out there is being denied a relationship with you. There's someone who would love everything about you and you would love everything about them. You are someone's lid and someone else is your pan. And don't hold back. Love completes you. Having someone who loves you, believes in you, supports you, and has got your back is the best feeling in the world. I denied myself love for so long because I thought I wasn't lovable. And now my only regret is that I didn't fix that sooner. But I love fixing it sooner than other people, including you. So if you would like to feel more lovable, to go from saying no one loves me to wow, I have so much love in my life. This is extraordinary. Little old me who came from nothing has got love. After all, everybody loved Princess Diana. Everybody loved Marilyn Monroe. Everybody loved George Michael and Michael Jackson and Heath Ledger and Freddie Mercury. Do you know who didn't love them? They didn't love themselves. And also don't be the kind of person that says, you know, I've wanted love. I found someone who loves me, but I don't understand why they love me. I faked it. If they love me, there's something wrong with them. I'm going for someone I don't want. I'm faking it because I'm so scared of being alone. The best thing is to know you're worth love, worthy of love, ready to love, that love is available to you and that you'd rather be alone with you until you find the right love. And when you know you're lovable, you find it really, really quickly. People have said to me, you know, I listened to your recording and weirdly, I found love in my apartment building. I'd lived there for 10 years and yet I met a guy in the elevator and we're together. I found love in the store, in the pet food aisle, buying a jar of coffee. I found love on the subway, on the bus. I found love with my next, one of my clients said, it's so weird. I listened to your audio. I met the guy next door. He's lived next door for five years. He'd never registered. And suddenly he said to me, there's something about you. I've got to talk to you. Another one was that I was doing my grocery shopping and this guy hit on me. That's never happened before, but he was so nice. And we're still together. Click on the link in the bio and see what happens when you play the lovability audio and wire in, fire in, code into you the unshakable, unwavering knowing that you are lovable just the way you are and you always will be. It's like that song by Billy Joel, don't go changing to try to please me. I love you just the way you are. And Bridget Jones, when she said, I love Bridget, just the way she went, we went, oh, I want that. But you know what? You can have it. Today in our world, we have a loneliness epidemic that is new, unfathomable, almost unexplainable. How come people are so lonely, so alone? Why have we got more lonely old people than ever before? More lonely teenagers than ever before? more depression, more anxiety, more young kids who actually feel suicidal because they are all alone. Because social media is never going to wrap their arms around you and make you feel better the way a real 
physical person can. We're living in a world today where we are all confusing online connection with real connection. Today, only 56% of teenagers have ever been on a real physical date, compared to 85% in the previous generations. We've also got other studies that show that one in three couples break up due to social media disagreements. When we look at these studies, we really have to examine the impact our online behavior is having on our real lives and especially on our real relationships. So a lot of people believe that social media is the savior of relationships. With dating apps, we can finally find someone. And there may be some truth in that, but a lot of dating apps don't work. They allow people to have so many different possibilities that they never really connect. They swipe and reject for really superficial reasons. And so what's happening with a whole generation is that they no longer can connect. They connect on FaceTime, they connect on dating apps, but they don't connect in real life. They don't actually know how to have relationships anymore. And social media also allows us to compare ourselves with these false images. Many, many people putting their picture on a dating profile, it's not even them. And if it is them, it is so heavily photoshopped. And so we have this problem going on that social media is distorting our ability to connect. Getting likes is not bonding. That's not real. That is fake. Getting people to like a picture of you that doesn't even really look like you, that is 10 years old or has been photoshopped or altered or just happened to be a really good one. When people connect to that, they are not connecting to you. Real connection is when your friends love you with all your flaws, your partner sees you with red eyes and a runny nose because you're sick and makes you soup or looks after you. That is real connection. And we now have a generation that don't understand connection. They don't even talk on the phone. They WhatsApp, they text, but they don't ever leave messages. And when you don't speak on the phone, you miss all the little tones in someone's voice that you can read. And we all know that you can spend ages talking to someone online and one phone call says, oh no, or maybe, oh yes. So although we are seeing social media as a, an ability to get people together, it actually disconnects. And here's the truth. When we are born on the planet, we must Find connection and avoid rejection because that is how we survive. We survive by connecting to people and avoiding being rejected. And many years ago, survival was very much a numbers game. But we really haven't changed. Babies know I must connect. And I'm always amazed people say, yeah, I've got, you know, a virtual babysitter. I read my kid a story at night on WhatsApp because I'm on the other side of the country or I have a baby cam and I'm at work and I talk to my baby through the camera, but it's not the same. We need real relationships, real hugs, real conversation, real eye contact, real voices, real people. And while there's some good in dating apps, they, you can say, okay, I'm in a job, or I maybe I'm in an all female office or an all male office, or maybe I'm in a bank and I'm not allowed to date at work. I can find someone else, that's true. But in order to find someone else, you need to look for someone who is real. And just ask yourself real questions. Is this person real? Are they genuine? Are they authentic? Are they warm? Do we share the same interests? Don't look for what weight they are, what shape they are, what job they are, what salary they have. You need to make real connections with real people and if you are using dating apps, it's okay, but you need to meet those people as soon as you possibly can. You can speak online a couple of times, but meet. I meet people who said, I spent two years talking to this guy that I met him. It was like, oh no, 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 no. I spent a year and a half talking to this girl. She turned up and it was like, no. But that's a huge waste. If I interview people online, and I've interviewed lots of people online. It's very useful initially, but I have to meet them face to face. I have to meet them, see them, really connect them before I can employ them. 
So you have to get over using social media as the only way to meet people, to date someone, to employ someone, to get to know someone. It will never ever compare to meeting real people in the flesh. My mother was a great example of the benefit and not benefits of social media. She could talk to her grandchildren all over the world. She actually loved Zoom and FaceTime because she could speak. And that was very good, but at social gatherings, every grandchild, every niece, every nephew was on the phone. And she always said, you know, I don't have a phone. I can't do that. She felt very left out. She'd go to a family event and the young generation all had their iPads out, their phones out. They were taking pictures of the food, texting each other across the table. One niece would text one nephew in the same room. And I saw how she was very, very disconnected because she wasn't talking to her extended family because they were talking to each other on WhatsApp. One of the reasons that eating disorders are on the rise in a younger generation, even amongst young guys, and one of the reasons self-harming is on the rise and depression and anxiety is because that generation are exposed every day to false images of perfection. They go online and think, oh, all these people have got fat hair and thin thighs, but I've got thin hair and fat thighs, so therefore I don't count. Yes, you do. We look at everyone else, they, they look better in their clothes, they're more trendy, more witty, they're having better holidays, they seem to have more money, they seem to have everything better. It's not real. One of the things I really don't like is when you see a celebrity just had a baby turn up in his pair of skin tight jeans, a little tank top going, hey, look at me, I had a baby and I'm the perfect size two again. But that's not true. It's Photoshop. They've had staff who've looked after the baby, made them juices. Maybe they've worked out a lot. Their hair and makeup look great because they have an army of staff behind them. And for someone else who's gone home with a brand new baby and still has to do the laundry, the dishes, look after another baby, they can't compare. And that's what I actively dislike about social media. You compare yourself to images that are fake, that aren't real. We are all influenced by social media, even though we don't know it. Our minds are being rewired through social media. I work with many, many people who have no idea how to fall in love with themselves. They've read a book that says, love yourself, but it doesn't really mean anything. How do you love yourself? Well, first of all, it is vital, essential, crucial for you to love yourself. If you want anyone to love you and be with you and stay with you, they have to believe you're worth loving. And if you attract someone by faking it and pretending, they very quickly work out that you don't think you're worth it, then they don't think you're worth it. So what I see so many people doing is this classic mistake of trying to make someone else love them. I'm going to find this guy and try to make him love me. I'm going to find this girl, this woman, and try to make them love me. I'm going to run after love, chase after love, work so hard. I'm going to earn that love of being super good or super hot or super nice or super indispensable. And that is all a mistake. Love is not to be earned. Love is not to be worked for or run after or bought or even traded. And if you want to find love, there's one thing you have to change. It is not your body. It's not your weight, your shape, your size, the years on your birth certificate. Nothing has to be snipped off or injected in to make you feel lovable. Nothing has to be bought, added, taken away. The only thing you need to find love is a belief that you are lovable. You see, people love you to the degree that they think you're worthy of being loved. We all know that story. I couldn't find a partner. I was in an emotional wasteland, a relationship wasteland for four years. I met someone, and how weird, in that same month, three other people asked me out. That's because when someone loves you and goes, hey, I just called to hear your voice. I just, I just rang your answer machine just to hear your voice. I just was looking at your picture. I just checked in to say you're the best thing that's ever happened. We think, oh, I'm so lovable now. When we feel lovable, other people also notice that we are lovable. 
But here's the mistake we make. We go to someone, hey, could could you make me feel lovable? Could you could you could you make me believe I'm worth loving? Could you love me? Could you meet my unmet need to feel lovable, to feel desirable, to feel worthy? Some people go, yep, yeah, of course. You want me to love you? I'll sign up for that. I can make you feel lovable desirable, sexy, worth being with. But the problem is when you give someone the job of making you feel lovable, you also give them the job of removing that whenever they want to. They may turn up for a week, a year, five years, but if their job is to make you feel good about you, the other side of that coin is when they leave, you feel bad about you. Oh, I'm not lovable. After all, that person that loved me found someone younger, taller, nicer, smarter. The only person who can make you feel really good about you is you. You must fall in love with yourself. Of course, you can find love, attract love, maintain love. But the other person can only make you feel as lovable as you already know that you are. So you have to fall in love with you. And once you do that, it's a game changer. When you fall in love with yourself, it's a lifelong romance. It never bores you. It never tires you, no shaving or waxing is involved in order to fall in love with yourself. You don't have to dress up for it, you can just be yourself. And here's another truth, you are going to spend the longest relationship in your entire life with you. You may have kids, but you're 30 when you have them, you may find love when you're 30, but they didn't have those first 30s. Your parents may love you, but they die before you. The longest relationship you will ever have in your entire life is with yourself. Now I can hear the question, but yeah, okay, but how, how, how? Well, it's very easy. First of all, you think of what would someone who would love you say to you? Imagine you've got the best lover in the world. What would they say? Well, you know what they'd say. Hey, I just love the very bones of you. I'm in love with your soul. I just love you. You're the best thing that ever happened. What do all those songs go? I can't live without you. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. So say it to yourself. Think of what you most want to hear and say it. Hey, I love you. I'm in love with you. You're amazing. Every time you go past the mirror, go, there you are. Look at you, you beautiful creature. Look at you. You are lovable. You're kind. You're warm. You're nice. You're funny. You've got a big heart. Say everything you long to hear and dream of hearing to yourself. When you say it, your mind doesn't go, who's saying that? Who's saying that? He goes, oh, you're saying it? Well, if you say it, it must be true. You see, your mind knows someone else. Go, hey, I love you so much. Can you lend me $20? Your mind understands that other people can manipulate you with praise. If you say it, it must be true. If you say, I love myself or I can't love myself, I've got fat legs, it must be true. So think about the words you most want to hear. Say them and say them and say them. And just like putting lotion on dry skin, they will sink in and nourish you from the inside out. Nourish your soul with words where you nourish your chap lips with Vaseline and it will nourish you. Look in the mirror and go, I love you. I love you. I love you because you're lovable. Don't ever go, I love you because you're smart, because you're a size six because you earn a lot of money, because you're a great dentist. No, I love you because you're lovable. So say the words you always wanted to hear, fill up that missing part of you with your own words, nourish your soul and spirit with words. Look in the mirror and say, I love you. I know it feels silly, but who cares if it brings to you lasting love? Isn't that worth it? Believe you are lovable when you know you are lovable just the way you are. You allow the whole world to see that, of course, you are lovable just the way you are. And we live in a world that's been very unfair and it's made us believe that only perfect people find love. But that's not true. I love the fact that now, especially in my country, there are two girls with Down syndrome who are models. In, in America, there is a girl, Amy Mullins, who is missing her lower limbs, and she's a catwalk model, married to Rupert Friends, a massive movie star. There's a girl, I believe her name is Carmen Young Brown, who has vitiligo, impetigo, and is a gap model, and is extraordinarily beautiful, but not perfect. 
And you see, you don't have to be beautiful to find love. You don't have to be perfect. In my experience of 33 years, people who try to be perfect are always unhappy, you know, as they almost always are, alone. Supermodels get left. Beautiful people don't even get asked out because people think, well, no, they've got a perfect life. Many of my clients are models and rock stars. say, I'm lonely. People don't ask me out. I worked with a beautiful, breathtaking model who said, all the men I date diminish me and put me down because they feel I'm too beautiful for them. If beauty made you happy, every beautiful person would be happy. And we know what they're not. We know that Whitney Houston, extraordinary beautiful, was unhappy. Heath Ledger, what a beautiful, beautiful man, was unhappy. So if you want to feel lovable, fall in love with yourself. Nobody can do it like you can. And when you fall in love with yourself, instead of saying, oh, could you make me feel good? Could you make me feel good? Could you make me feel good? You go, well, I feel good. I am good. I'm here. I'm lovable. And if you want to join in and we can love each other, that's great. I love me. And you can love me and I can love you. And I hope you already love you because I can only love what's already there. I don't want a broken person to try and put back together again. You know, hurt people hurt people. Damaged people damage people. You can start from being hurt. You can start from being damaged. And you heal your very soul when you fall in love with yourself. And by the way, we all know that if a bodybuilder wants to make a muscle bigger, they must break it, rest it, and build it up. And a broken heart is just the same. It's broken, and then it builds up bigger and better. And if you've had a broken heart, then you have a big, beautiful heart. Your scars make you more beautiful. Allow yourself to find love by doing the one thing that guarantees you'll find it. Know you're lovable. Know you're worth it. Fall in love with yourself. It changes everything. It really is a game changer. Why do relationships that start so well fall apart? Well, there's one mistake that people often make, and I'm going to show you how to avoid making that same mistake in your relationship. So here's the biggest mistake we make. We expect our partner to be psychic to be a clairvoyant, to know what we're feeling, to know what we're thinking, and to know what we need. And I see many people do this. What's wrong? Nothing. You seem a bit upset. Nope, I'm fine. Everything in your body language is saying, I'm upset, but you expect your partner to know why you're upset when you haven't even told them. And when you're in a heterosexual relationship, it's even more confusing because men expect their female partner to act like a guy, and women often expect the male to act like a female. You know, one of my clients came in and said, I can never make my wife happy. I come in at the end of the day and she starts to tell me what's happened. The dog was sick, the daughter forgot her lunchbox, the boss, and he goes, oh, well, what I would have done then is, you know, you need to have that lunchbox by the front door, you need to explain, you need to explain to your boss. And she said, I don't want that. Why does he keep trying to fix it when I just want him to hear? And I said, you know what? You gotta become her best girlfriend. You gotta say things like this, oh, I hate that for you. He said, really? I said, yeah. She is looking to know that you have heard her. So when she gives the list, the dog ran away, My, the daughter forgot the lunchbox, her boss at work was so mean, don't offer solutions, become her best girlfriend, go, baby, I hate that for you. That's horrible. And he said, wow. Came back, said, I never knew to just going, oh, oh, becoming like a girlfriend to my wife. It's amazing. Some of you might say, well, I'm never going to do that. But for him, it really worked. You know, I had a situation many, many, many years ago. My father was ill. He'd had a surgery and he nearly died under anesthetics. So they had to do it again. And there was a big chance he wouldn't survive. And I had to call him and effectively say goodbye to him. And I was psyching myself for this call and I was very emotional. And then when I picked up the phone, my then partner just left and went to play golf. I'm like, wow, he is not my partner anymore. I'm feeling vulnerable, sad and emotional. And his response is to go and play golf. What a cold, mean, horrible, nasty person. When he came back, I said, how could you do that? He went, oh, 
I thought you'd really appreciate being left alone because me, if I was about to have that conversation with my dad and I'd be tearful as a man, I wouldn't want anyone around. So I left you as an act of kindness to cope with your grief without being humiliated. So you see what went on there? He did what a man would do and I wanted to do what a girl would do. And there's a disconnect. And in all of these disconnections, you go, he doesn't care, she doesn't care, they don't care, when really they're doing what they think you want them to do or what they would like you to do to them. And I see that in sex a lot. Women say, I want you to stroke my hair and stroke my men are like, just, just grab me in the crutch. That's what I really want. So I'll just grab you in the crutch. And we're like, what? That's not what I want. Where's my seduction? But you have to come at it even in same-sex relationships. So my husband told me, darling, I can only shop for two hours. I'm like, great, two hours, that's good. So we go to a shop and he said, let's have lunch first. We have lunch. Then he goes, okay, got 30 minutes left to shop. I'm like, no, that's not right. I thought we had two hours of shopping. No, we have two hours park the car, go for lunch, and whatever time is left is to shop. So now I went, right, we'll do that. We're going to shop first now. And when we finish shopping, we go, oh, look, we've got 15 minutes for lunch, but that's our deal. So we just have to constantly explain. I love it when my husband goes out for the whole evening because I love time to myself. He'll go out, and I've just got my box set. I'm on the phone to my girlfriends. He comes back. I thought I'd come back early. I'm like, no, I was just getting my whole evening started. He loves company, doesn't ever like to be alone. I love being alone sometimes. So I have to explain to him, when you're out, please don't come back early for me. Come back early for you. I love the whole evening to myself. So the first thing is to understand, is your partner doing what they think you want them to do? because that's what they want you to do to them. The second is to not think, well, if they are doing that, they're doing it to hurt me. They've forgotten my birthday, they don't care. They bought me a really cheap gift and that's all I mean to them. They're not celebrating the way I want to celebrate. And the only way you can get this mistake to go away is to really set up a dialogue. Okay, we're together, my birthday is really important. If you say we have an hour together to talk and you're looking at your phone or scrolling through your emails, that's not an hour together. If you say we're going out or you're cooking dinner to have a lovely evening, leave all the dishes everywhere and go to bed and don't do anything, it doesn't work. I said to my husband one day, you know when we're downstairs, occasionally I'm going to bed and you just get up and go to bed. And then I have to lock all the doors and windows and I don't feel protected. I want you to always lock up so I feel you're concerned about my safety. He loved that. He now, he's like a man protecting me. Now every night he checks all the doors and because I told him nicely, baby, when you just get off the sofa and go to bed, I don't feel cared about. You leave me to lock all the doors. But I said it in a nice way. And now he understands it's not important to him very important to me. So sit down with your partner and talk. Because you know what I see happen? People go, he's not the right person. She's not the right person. They don't meet my needs. They don't know what I want. They don't understand. You know what they do? Upgrade them. Swipe left. Get someone new. We get rid of people like we get rid of our phone. And it's so easy to start again, but all my clients that do that say, you know what happened? I got a new partner and the same problems happened with a new one. They were just as bad as the last one, just as unthinking, just as uncaring, just as insensitive. And I'm like, oh, do you think there's a pattern here? Do you know for most people, not all, but for most, it's actually easier to make an existing relationship better to make an existing relationship work than to go for a new one and take the same problems, the same belief that they're clever and that the right person knows what to do in bed, knows what you want to eat. 
And sometimes people do things that they think are really okay and they go out and buy you weird underwear you'd never wear, perfume that you think is disgusting, chocolates when you're on a diet, they bring home pizza when you're starving yourself and you go, this person doesn't care, but they don't understand. You know, I had the funniest experience. I had to have a hysterectomy five years ago. My husband turned up the next morning with my laptop and said, I thought you might want to answer emails. I'm like, are you serious? I just had major surgery. In fact, I went home that day. I felt great and I did laugh that he brought my laptop in because he thought I might want to work. He knows how much I'm always on my computer, always answering emails, but not that day. But you know what? If he'd had surgery, he would be on his laptop probably an hour later because he loves working. But you see, I had to realize he wasn't trying to hurt me. It wasn't offensive. He truly thought it would give me immense pleasure to open my laptop and start answering emails. One of my clients did that an hour after she gave birth. She answered emails because she wanted that. I can't think of anything worse than that. So please don't make this mistake early in a relationship. Don't pretend, I like what you like. Don't say, oh, I'll keep that to myself. Tell people what you want. I never forget seeing a client once and he said, you know, I dated this girl last month and she sent me a message and she said, you didn't try hard enough in bed. I don't want to see you again. He said, what a woman. I'm seeing her again. She really put me in my place. He said, I like that. She's going to make me work so hard. Most women would think I could never write to him. I go, hey, you didn't try hard enough in bed. You're toast. But she did. And he loved that because she told him what she needed, more effort in bed, more courtesy to her and make it all about her. And he found that so sexy and a challenge he was absolutely going to meet. Many women think, oh, I better not say what I want. I don't want to be seen as difficult. I don't want to be seen as demanding. Why don't I pretend? I'm so easily pleased and I'll make you happy. It doesn't work, even early on. Tell them what your needs are. Tell them what your desires are. And if you think, you know, my partner's forgetting it's my birthday. They're not mentioning it. They're going to forget my birthday because they don't care. Why don't you change and I go, hey, you know what? They love me. They want to celebrate my birthday. I'm going to tell them, hey, it's my birthday next Thursday. I know you want to do something amazing. So let me give you some ideas of what I want. A few years ago, I realized my daughter didn't remember my birthday. She was talking about Wednesday, which was my birthday. And I could have thought, right, she's going to forget. I'm going to let her forget and then tell her off and go, you didn't even remember my birthday and create so much drama. Instead, I took a breath and I said, it's my birthday on Wednesday. She went, oh yeah, of course it is. What shall we do? And we had a great day because I pulled back from, you've forgotten, let me sit this out and then let me go after you with hurt and anger and disappointment. It was easier just to tell her. So please don't do that. We've all done it. Tell me what you want, tell me what you need. Be honest about your feelings. When someone disappoints you, say, you know, I'm disappointed, I was upset, I was hurt by. Don't say you made me feel unimportant, you forgot, you didn't. When you are always late to pick me up, I know you don't care about me, rather than I know you care about me, and if you could just pick me up on time, I would feel even more cared about. I could have said to my husband, when you go to bed and don't even lock the door, you don't care about me. I said, I know you care about me and you can show me how much you care about my safety by always locking the doors before you go to bed. He does. So try starting from that. I know you care about me. I know you want to make this work. I know you're invested in both of us being happy. This is what I need. Share your needs, share your wants, share your desires. And remember, your partner is not psychic is not clairvoyant and they're only going to know what you want and need 
when you tell them. After all, if you said to a friend or a child, hey, what do you want for your birthday? And they go, well, what I really want is that Game Boy or that, I'd love to go to a theme park, I'd love to go shopping, I'd love to go for lunch. You give them what they want. It doesn't make the day worse. I say to my daughter every year, what do you want for your birthday? And she tells me and I provide it. And it's better because I know what she wants. I say to my husband, what do you want? He wants a book, just a book. If he bought me just a book on my birthday, it would not be a happy day, but he knows. I don't have the same desire you have. For me, birthdays are a big deal. Christmas is a big deal. It's not the thought that counts because I don't want a book. I'd like flowers. I'm going to tell you what I want. And here's where the thought that counts really goes wrong. Many people think, I buy my partner a washing machine. She said she wants one. I buy her a sewing machine. I buy her a vacuum cleaner. Domestic appliances are not gifts for Christmas or birthday. One of my clients bought his wife a subscription to the Sports Channel, saying, you know, I thought you might find some yoga classes on there. She's like, no, 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 you're going to find lots of football. That's not a gift that I want. You can have that gift, but you still need to get me a gift. So the thought counts when you think what your wife would really want or your husband would really want and don't make it any kind of domestic appliance unless they've told you I would love a lawnmower for Christmas. If they haven't told you that, don't get them a power washer unless you know they really want one, especially for women. Appliances are work. They're not gifts. Unless they say, I'd love that dishwasher for Christmas, don't even go there. It is the thought that counts, but not the thought of a book from Amazon. But he loves a little book. Something that costs $5 will thrill him. Doesn't thrill me because we're different, but we, we both completely understand each other's needs. In fact, my daughter's godmother said to me, you know, I buy your daughter amazing gifts for my birthday and you don't do the same. And I didn't think it was a two-way transaction, but I heard her and then I started to buy her great gifts. Another of my clients said, my partner gives me my gift in a carrier bag, never wraps it up. And I had to say to me, no, I like it wrapped with ribbons. And of course, underneath that fear of, I don't want to tell you what I really want. I don't want to share what I really need in case you reject me. Because of course, our greatest fear is being rejected. When you can't show someone who you are and can't have the relationship you want because you're not being yourself, you end up rejecting yourself. Nobody can reject you without your consent. And if the person you would, would reject you because you are sharing your needs, they're not your person. The right person will never reject you. In fact, they'll go out of their way to understand your needs because you've had the confidence to express them so nicely, so eloquently with the knowledge that you are worthy of expressing your needs and having them met. And your partner, of course, is worthy of expressing their needs and having them understood and mostly met. One of my clients told me that every year her husband gave her for Christmas a red panzanetta with a $50 bill in it. And one year she threw the whole thing on the floor, locked herself in the toilet and said, that's it. She also said that every year he gave her the same card he gave her the year before and thought that was good because he's into recycling. And she said, I'm about to recycle you. If you recycle that card for one more year, you're going to be recycled. And then he didn't do it anymore. He realized she wants a new card with a new message, not the same one, not a jokey message. She told him what she wanted. He never again gave her a plant with $50 tucked into the soil. He never again recycled the card because she told him. She went through a lot of pain first, but when she told him, he immediately met her needs because she told him what her needs were. Work out your needs, feel comfortable sharing them. Don't dismiss someone who doesn't understand you if you haven't taken the time to let them understand you by showing them who you are, what you need, what you want. Be honest and remember, we like people who show their vulnerability and we don't connect to people who appear to be perfect. 
in relationships, vulnerability is good. I was having lunch with a lovely couple the other day, and she said, you know, he said to me, I thought I'd never find someone again. She went, you? You're gorgeous, you're everything. She said, can you imagine this lovely man thinking he would never find love again? He was vulnerable. When he told her that, she loved him more. The basis of friendship and relationships, we like people who share our vulnerabilities, and we dislike people who appear perfect and who never express their needs, and then we never get the joy of meeting them. So if you would love to explore how to attract and maintain your perfect relationship, grow in love, just click the link in the description below. And I wish you a joyful, happy, loving, wonderful relationship where you express your needs, and guess what? They get met. If you enjoyed that video, check out the next one right here. You can also click the link below right here for your free gift. We have a choice. You can go, I'm in agony, my head is killing me, which is not true. You can go, I've got a headache, it's slightly annoying, but I'm gonna take